Thank you for being here. I am here to share with you some reflections uh, on Laudato Si, the Pope's letter on the environment, some reflections that will help us respond to the environmental crisis these days. I have some bullets here to share with you, uh, just four, and I hope that any of these bullets will somehow strike you. Uh, please know that we don't have to take all these bullets. The first part is really to understand, to try to understand the complexity, the complexity itself of the problem. Second is uh, to offer some reflections on the roots of the crisis. And for this, Pope Francis helps us immensely. The third bullet is to outline some possible response, some response to, to, this, to this crisis itself. And at the end, I wish to share with you some 10, 10 simple steps, which I hope that you will also try to generate in your own way. So first, don't be frightened, please, with this equation. This is just a simple equation that tells you that tomorrow depends a lot on what you have today. That the change of something will depend on how much you have of it right now. So if you try to solve this equation, mathematicians call this a differential equation. But when you solve this equation, you find out that, well, in English at least, it translates into something like this. In growing, when things grow, they start slowly. Then they grow more rapidly later. When you try to graph this, you see that familiar exponential curve. Uh, and I think we're very much familiar with this curve these days because of the pandemic. This describes very much how things move and how they move in an accelerated fashion. They pick up. Kung sa Tagalog, may arangkada. And so it happens that towards the latter part of this curve, it becomes more difficult to apply the brakes because you are, you are speeding up. This applies to not just things that go viral, like viruses. It applies to even nuclear explosions. You know, when atoms split, they affect other atoms that split further, and so you have an explosion. It even applies to gossip or even fake news. Things go exponential. And so it's important for us to understand that this is something that is perhaps a fundamental feature of nature. That number, it's a number actually called E, well, it's a mysterious number, just like pi. You don't know where it comes from. But it is a number that regulates or describes this kind of growing. So if you look at greenhouse gases, or what they call these gases that warm the atmosphere, for instance, you see this upward movement. And it's not just a straight line. It's a line that starts slowly and then starts to pick up. And the question is, of course, how do you flatten this curve? Uh, right now, we don't know really whether, for instance, if this is a cancer curve, are we in stage four? A cancer in stage one is just moving slowly. But then as things progress, right, we, and sometimes we ask, how come it only just took a matter, it was just a matter of weeks before this person uh, fell or this person died. And it's because that person was already in stage four. Well, the question for us now is, are we in stage three, stage four? We don't know, actually, of this crisis, that things of things picking up these greenhouse gases. So, so for instance, if I were to just summarize, the, cli the climate problem can be very complicated, but I guess now we can just summarize it, simplify it this way that we've been growing, okay? We've been growing perhaps exponentially, compounded, and this, was, this is being fueled by carbon. Carbon is the fuel. You see this in our power plants, even in our cars. Every time we flick a switch, carbon is released to the atmosphere. That carbon has also been growing in the atmosphere. That has led to temperatures also rising exponentially, and then Consequence of that is risk, danger, harm, also growing. So in a picture like this, that perhaps is just a, a summary of what we are what we are up with, what we are trying to contend with these days. So 
just an example uh, of, a, of an impact, a possible impact, and it's already happening, sea level. Sea level is rising all throughout the world. Well, in this part of the world, the Western Pacific, I don't know why, uh, but perhaps because the Western Pacific is one of the warmer parts of the ocean, sea levels are rising the fastest. The Western Pacific is where we are. Okay. Right now, it's rising at about 3 millimeters per year. You say, oh, that's small. Yeah, but it's picking up. Okay. That rate is picking up every year. And so we have to be concerned about sea level rise in this part of the world. Now you say, so what? We just move more inland? Well, yeah, but sea level is not just a matter of eating up real estate or our beaches. Sea level means that when storms come, the surges, the waves will be higher and they'll even affect us more inland. That means salt water intruding into our, to our fresh water supplies. So this is something that we need to also be worried about, sea level, in this part of the world. If you were to ask me, what's the solution? Well, we need to flatten the curve. What curve? The carbon curve. We need to stabilize carbon the way carbon is being released into the atmosphere. And that means really restructuring our economy. For the longest time, our economies have been fueled by oil, coal, natural gas. And so we need to look for alternative sources that are reliable, that are not as expensive. And there are. There are options already out there. It's just difficult. It's just difficult to put things in place right now. Well, maybe because of this pandemic, we will be able to set things already. The second curve that we need to flatten is really the risk curve, the danger curve. Okay. And, and for this, we, need, we have a technical term. We call it adaptation. If sea levels are going to rise, what do we do? Well, we have to move people out of harm's way. We have to start planning our cities, our land, well. And so adaptation is also social, is social reform. We have to be able to look at these risk factors and try to transfer or reduce the risk to our communities and to our own selves. If we're going to reduce the carbon, we also ask, well, where's the carbon? Well, one proxy indicator is look at the lights. Follow the lights. Where are the lights? This nighttime picture of the world tells you that you know, many parts of the world are, are really lit up, meaning they're consuming a lot of energy. Look at the Philippines. I don't know if you can see the Philippines somewhere there in Southeast Asia. Sabi nga nila, brown out. No? Uh, it's sometimes hard to see the Philippines uh, at night. Well, yes, you can say that because we are small, we are still an emerging economy, that our carbon footprint is still not that large. But it will become large as we, as we progress. So th this, this picture actually is an indicator of, of where carbon is. So if you want to save on carbon, if you want to cut down the big spenders, this, is, this map is, is a good indicator. If you want to reduce risk, then you just look at, well, where are, the, where are the riskier places in the planet these days as far as climate change is concerned? Well, here's one graph. Uh, you can see that you know, the red parts, the red countries, are usually developing countries, but not necessarily developing countries. These are countries that are hit by disasters every so often. And the Philippines is right up there. So, this leads us to a complicated issue, and it's an issue that we call the climate ethical problem, a question of justice. You see, growth itself is differentiated. There are countries that are growing much faster than the others. That means their carbon footprint is larger. But there's only one temperature, one global temperature that we all share. And the risk borne is also differentiated. Kung sino pa yung mahirap, yung walang contribution, so basura, na carbon, halimbawa, sila pa yung magdurusa, sila pa yung mahihirapan. So this becomes an ethical issue, a justice issue, an issue of fairness. Uh, and that's why it's very difficult to bring countries sometimes together because of these ethical 
and social issues. Pope Francis has been reflecting on this and he says, well, the, the roots of this crisis are actually just two. And he says, first, it's a, it's, it's a term he calls a technocracy. It's, it's this blind faith that technology will, will solve problems. Second is a misguided anthropocentrism, which just means really a misguided sense of where we are, our place in the universe. So let me just explain what, what these two terms uh, mean. The first is, you know, uh, by technocracy, he means this, this abiding faith that, you know, we can control nature, that we are supposed to really control nature. Well, you know what happens when we try to control nature. The second is this, this phenomenon of fragmentation, which we've sort of put things in boxes. We want things manageable because reality is very complex. We say, well, let's, let's partition things. Material reality, we put in one box. Non-material things, never mind. Okay? We'll, that's, a, that's for the theologians. That's for the philosophers. Let them worry about these things. So these two, these two forces actually contribute to the crisis, the problem itself. Just an example, for instance, things come in waves in our lives. Things go up, they go down. Water goes up, water goes down. Well, yeah, carbon also goes up, goes down. There is a frequency. There are waves. And before we came into the picture, carbon would go up from volcanoes, you know, eruptions, etc. Then they'd go down, settle. They'd go down to the ocean floor. They'd become converted to fossils and fossil fuel, etc. In the last 200 years, what we've done is really we've dug up the earth took out that carbon, burned it, pumped it into the atmosphere. So we've actually sped up one arm of the cycle. And so things are a little out of kilter. They're skewed. And because of this out-of-balance arrangement, we're getting these problems. The other is separation, fragmentation. As I mentioned, we've said, well, if it's material or if it's chemistry, if it's physics, let's separate them. That, that is good for science. That's why science has progressed. It has delineated, it's defined its boundaries, yes. But then, as we know, reality is more than just these fences, these boxes. So part of the crisis is that we've excluded some of the more important dimensions of who we are, of what life is, in our attempt to control or to to harness nature to our own self. The other cause, he says, of the crisis is this misguided, is this misguided sense of place. And we have to steer clear of two extremes. The first is this idea that we are the king and queen of the universe. We are the center. And that, therefore, everything around us is supposed to be for us for our benefit. This kind of human exceptionalism is something that we need to avoid. Well, the other extreme that we also need to avoid is this inferiority complex. The sense that I am just like the trees or the stars. I am just part of nature. And so just a member of this family. And therefore, that effect of that is to abstain or to abdicate our own responsibility for, for the transformation of nature or for the taking care of this garden. So these are the two uh, causes of the crisis. In the next lecture, uh, I, I will try to reflect with you on possible pathways, uh, possible response pathways, so that we can not just be depressed, you know, and say, look, it, this is a complicated problem. How do we even begin to solve? How do we even begin to flatten this climate curve? Uh, we are not without hope. And in the next lecture, I hope to share with you some possible response pathways that we can undertake. Mm -hmm.